Hello, everyone, and welcome to our NMQF Friday webinars. We are still going strong, even in a virtual environment that has sometimes moved to hybrid. It is SHC's turn to bring to you our Champions for Total Health, the Pandemic's Toll on Mental Health webinar today. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Kristen Hobbs. I'm the Director of Quality Improvement and Equity here at National Minority Quality Forum's Center for Sustainable Healthcare Quality and Equity. Um, these webinars really came about from our communities telling us um, and lamenting that they did not want to continue to talk about vaccines only as their way to total health. And so each month, SHC will be focusing on several chronic illnesses and total health topics that really lead to advanced health equity. I am here with some esteemed panelists today, and I will share my screen so that we can get started with our presentation. So um, you all are in listen only mode and your videos are turned off. We ask that you place all your questions in the Q&A box for our Q&A portion. We do have some pre-submitted questions that I will be reading and um, getting our panelists to answer today. But if you do have questions while the webinar is coming, is, is going and anything arises, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. Um, we welcome respectful communication in the chat box as well. Well, please let us know where you're calling in from. Um, please let us know all of your thoughts, especially when we get to the interactive portion. So this webinar is highly interactive and we encourage you to be honest in your feedback. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about NMQF and SHC, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Richard Harris so that he can go through all of the mental health inequities and risks of severe illness when we talk about COVID-19 and mental illness. And then I'll give you an overview of some of the vaccine data that are present, some ACIP recommendations from the CDC. And then we'll hear perspectives from public health professional and our faith leader, uh, Trevor Jennings and Reverend Bowens, respectively. And then we will walk you through our mental health um, microsite feedback. So what I'll do is I will show you the current draft of our mental health microsite. You get the inside scoop to see how the sausage is made. And then we will ask several questions where my colleague Chenny Ukuchoku will be taking notes on a jam board that we will share with you guys as well. So really quickly, National Minority Quality Forum started in 1998 by Dr. Gary Puckran really to advance health equity using evidence-based tools um, and reduce patient risk. And here at SHC, my title just changed y'all, so I hadn't had an opportunity to change everything yet. But we use that data to develop sustainable and healthy communities in every single zip code. Um, we focus on communities of color, or they're prioritized, but we really focus on all historically excluded communities. So rural communities, um, LGBTQI communities and the like. The crux of what we do is quality improvement in clinical education through a lens of health equity. And we try to marry quality improvement, clinical education and public health interventions. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Richard Harris, who is holistic internal medicine physician, a pharmacist specializing in lifestyle medicine, and the founder of Great Health Wellness and host of the Strive for Great Health podcast. Dr. Harris, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Kristen. I really appreciate this. I always start off any talk I do by thanking my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for allowing me to come and speak with you guys today and praying that this message is impactful and, and full of hope. Um, so that, you know, about me, I'm a holistic doc. I, I specialize in lifestyle medicine. I'm a pharmacist. I'm an MBA. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I, I do personalized medicine. And, and mental health is something that's very near and dear to my heart. My mom was physically abused and sexually abused. My dad was uh, sheltered after he lost his brother and his sister when he was very young and he has severe social anxiety. My sister's borderline personality disorder, multiple suicide attempts. Um, and so I grew up in a household full of, of mental illness and wondered why was I different? Why was I the only one that didn't have in these issues, even though I've had negative experiences? And I realized it was my life was different. My lifestyle was different. But we can talk about that later. Next slide, please. 
So what is mental health, right? And I've actually started to change the way I look at mental health and my definition of, of mental health. And, and the reason for that is the more I dig into the data and the more I dig into the research, you can't really separate out your mental health from your physical health because all the things that impact your mental health impact your physical health and all the things that impact your physical health affects your mental health. Typically, we think of mental health as emotional, psychological, spiritual, social, how we think about things, our associations, how we respond to stress, engagement and relationships, how we make choices. But all of those things are also impacted by our physical health, right? The, the physical limitations we might have might determine our choices or our emotional state or our, our mental state. And I've, I've realized that a lot of the things that are good for our mind are also good for our body, like exercise, right? Exercise is great for our physical health, but it's also one of the best things you can do for your emotional health. Meditation, mindfulness, great for your emotional health, but there's also data showing it, it makes us smarter. It changes the way our, our, our nervous system works. It changes our response to pain and stress. So these are physical changes that are happening because of changes in our mental and emotional state. Same thing with nutrition. What you eat can affect your mental health, can affect your physical health as well. Next slide, please. So poor mental health, what, what is poor mental health? And, and to me, I think of poor mental health as we all deal with negative things in life, right? There's no person in life who's ever had the perfect life, right? Even Jesus was hated by people. So if Jesus was hated by people and went through negative experiences, we're all going to go through negative experiences and deal with adverse um, events. And so what happens in situations, and it could be either due to genetic or upbringing or our environment, is that these stressors are more than our ability to cope, our ability to deal with what happens in life. And, and you can think about it as, as something snaps, something breaks, something changes, and we're not able to respond in a way that we think are appropriate. Now, that is, is, is mental health, but mental illness is, is taking that like a step further. And these, this is to a point where these conditions and these physiological changes that happen in the brain are impacting our daily life. Maybe we're a danger to ourselves. Maybe we're a danger to other people. Maybe <clears throat> we're not able to interact in society anymore. We're not able to perform our job anymore. It's, it's just that we've gotten to a point where there is actual illness to the same degree as like you'd have a diabetic who maybe loses a limb, right? That's a physical disease where we've had consequences that are making it different and difficult for us to perform certain things. So they're, they're separate. There's, there's a spectrum here. And we can see mental illness develop without poor mental health. You can see poor mental health develop without mental illness. They're not exactly the same thing, but they are on the same spectrum. Next slide, please. So what are the common causes we see of, of mental health or, or mental illness and honestly, the number one cause that I see and when I'm talking with people is childhood trauma. And we know that childhood trauma scores actually correlate very well with job performance, with um, your physical health later in life, because a lot of us have things that happen to us as kids and we don't process them. We just kind of bury them. And then we wonder why we do things that we do. I'll use this as an example. Uh, my wife tends to use retail therapy. For those who don't know what retail therapy is, this is when you get stressed, you go buy things. And when we first met, I was like, well, why do you do this? Like, why is it that when you get stressed, your first thing is go buy stuff? And it was because one of like her happy memories is going shopping with her mom. Right. She didn't have a lot of positive interactions with her mom as a kid, but that was one of the only ones. So she regressed back to a childhood state where shopping was something happy and protected to her. So she did that when she was stressed. So we carry along the scars and the behaviors of our, of our childhood into our uh, adult years. Another thing that I classically see is um, drug abuse or drug use, using those as, as ways to deal with stress. 
Uh, workplace stress, burnout is a big one right now. In my profession, physicians, it's estimated that 50% of the physicians like me, internal medicine are burnt out. And that's for numerous reasons, but it's affecting their personal lives. And it's also affecting the way that they are able to care for patients. Outcomes are worse when you have physician burnout. An interesting thing is, is discrimination and racism. Um, this actually changes our physiology. It changes the way we deal with stress. There are studies with African-Americans and racism, and it actually changes our stress response. It changes our ability to deal with stress. It makes us less resilient if we let it, less resilient when we encounter stressors. And so these are all things that we see all the time. Now, the I don't want to be all doom and gloom. The good news is we like to say that um, nature loads the gun, nurture pulls the trigger, right? We, we have our genes that predispose us to certain things, but we can change how we interact with our environment. And another thing is you can always change the thoughts that come into your head. No one's putting these thoughts in your head. I don't have a mind control device that tells you to think a certain way. Your ability to choose one thought over another is your best defense against stress, depression, and, and mental health. And that goes in like cognitive behavioral therapy and psychotherapy and all of those techniques. So there are ways that we can holistically address these. And if you need medication, don't be afraid to use medication in these scenarios. A lot of us are anti-med, we're, we're anti-vax, we're this, we're that, but it's part of a treatment platform. I always tell people, don't just depend on medications, don't just depend on vaccines, don't just depend on one input to save you, but there are multiple things that you can do with mental health, like things I've already mentioned, in addition to psychotherapy, behavioral therapy, um, and, and, and medication. So next slide. This is an interesting concept, allostatic load. And, and what we mean by allostatic load is that everything that happens to us in life, the things that put us under pressure are, are stressors. And these stressors can either be good. For instance, exercise is a good stressor when done in moderate amounts. We're not, we're not saying you, know, you need to run a marathon every day. That's not a good stressor. Things like fasting are good stressors. They prime our body by increasing resilience, putting the body through little bits of stress, controlled amounts of stress at a certain time actually makes us more resilient, makes us stronger. But what happens if we have too much of this, too many stressors, or they're not controlled stressors, or they're chronic, this can lead to dysfunction and it can lead to disease. I was reading a study uh, a couple of weeks ago that looked at if you have a mental health diagnosis and a physical health diagnosis, the increased risk of mortality or death from that, I believe was four or five times higher than if you had neither. All right. So what affects our, our mental health also affects our physical health and what stresses us physically or what stresses us mentally can also stress us physically. In fact, one of the things I talk about on my podcast and talk to clients about all the time is that chronic stress is a root cause of disease, a root cause of chronic disease. And it's insidious because oftentimes we don't equate uh, mental stress or being stressed out with the physical effects that happens in our body. And so this is the concept of allostatic load that too much stress or non-controlled stress or repeated stress or repeated events can lead to physical dysfunction and increase our rate of, of chronic disease. Next slide, please. So what, what happens in our community that, that exacerbates this? And it, it could be um, some of these other allostatic lows like racism, like um, uh, food deserts, like um, cultural norms, um, parenting thing type things. One of the things I often hear in the black community from uh, other from people is that, you know, we always get told by our parents don't do that because we said so. And that's not a good thing to tell a kid because when a kid does things, they're not really trying to challenge you as much as they're trying to figure out the rules to the game. And if you don't tell them the rules to the game, then they're going to explore things on their own. And so some of these these parenting norms that we think are just normal are actually adverse. And then we have 
um, uh, discrimination in the workplace. Those studies are, are well known. We have uh, discrimination just being out, like what happened in, in Buffalo recently, that tragedy. All of these things weigh heavily on us. But again, there are things that we can do to overcome this. And one of the things I think is, is banding together as a community and not just our own community, but reaching out to other minority communities and, and engaging in that shared experience of, of what other people have experienced and what their experience is like in America. And, and you know, it's like the old saying, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. And so I, I think banding together inside our community and banding together outside of our community uh, can can help everyone in, in this time of unprecedented uh, mental crisis. Next slide, please. So barriers, socioeconomic factors, you know, it's hard to find a good psychotherapist or, or, or therapist or mental health services. It's not easy. There are online programs like Talkspace. Um, uh, Headspace has online cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, most resources in the community are overburdened. There just aren't enough mental health providers. One of the things I like to address is the stigma. People often think it's weak to go seek help, but I think it's actually strong. Str weakness is keeping everything inside. Strength is going to someone and asking for help because that's the harder thing to do. And oftentimes we keep things inside and then it, it just eats us alive. We have to get things out of our head. And then there are disparities in mental health and, and care where the studies show that that African-Americans get different treatment at, at hospitals and facilities than than other races. And I always tell people that you have to be your best healthcare advocate. Don't just depend on what the doctor says or the nurse says. Do your own research. Ask questions. Ask why you need this therapy. Ask if there are all alternatives. Ask what I can do, you know, nutrition wise, exercise wise, stress management. What should I be eating? You know, ask about the, the relationships. What kind of people should I be having in my life? Right. These are all things that are important. You have to be your own health steward and your own health advocate. So what we know about mental health and COVID-19 is things are worse. So one study last year showed that 30% of the hospital uh, admissions were due to anxiety and depressive disorders. It was right next to obesity. It was the number two driver of COVID-19 hospital admissions. And we know that outcomes are worse. And so like we've talked about numerous times already, and I've already run over my time, I apologize, is that if you have, there are physiological changes, just like with diabetes and heart disease and all these things that happen with anxiety, with depression, with PTSD. And these actually impair immune function, impairs our, our inflammatory response, uh, impairs our, our hormones. And so taking care of our mental health takes care of our physical health, taking care of our physical health takes care of our mental health. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. That was a beautiful explanation of mental health and what the definitions are, allostatic load, mental health inequities. I really appreciate you bringing your expertise. And so with that, since we know that individuals who are living with mental illnesses could suffer um, the risk of complications, severe complications to COVID-19, hospitalization and or mortality, we know that it's important to get vaccinated and boosted, boosted right? Um, so here we have data for COVID-19 vaccines by race and ethnicity. Um, and as you can see, the red line shows Black non-Hispanic individuals in the U.S. As of April of this year, we're still on the lowest end of the spectrum with getting vaccinations and getting boosters. And so it's much of the same thing with the flu shot. We know that the flu shot can also have really disparate health outcomes in Black and Brown communities as well. So Black non-Hispanic uh, communities are the lowest uh, by uh, race and ethnicity to receive the influence of vaccine. Um, and doing these things as preventative measures can also help you maintain your lifestyle and physical and mental health so that you don't lead to complications of these two uh, diseases. 
So the CDC recommends a slew of adult vaccinations, and I won't go through all of them because they'll be provided for you on the microsite as well. Um, but here's just a quick snapshot. And these are um, the influenza vaccine, obviously, annually. Anyone who does not have contraindications six months or older, the CDC recommends to get a flu shot uh, annually. Um, more adult vaccinations. And then obviously for COVID-19, it is fully approved in uh, adults 18 years and older um, for use against the virus that causes COVID-19. And please get your second booster if you are eligible. So I wanted to quickly go through that so we can make up a little bit of time. Dr. Harris, do not, please do not apologize. We really want you to give your expertise. So if you go over time, we're all good here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Trevor Jennings. She is a public health expert. And we know, just like Dr. Harris said, a lot of our workforce, essential workers, public health professionals, clinicians, medical assistants, nurses, everyone has been feeling the brunt of this pandemic in very, very different ways. And so Trevor, could you speak to your experience navigating mental health during the pandemic and especially as a public health expert? Absolutely, and thank you so much, Kristen, for inviting me to present today. Um, so like Kristen said, my name is Trevor Jennings and I serve as the Senior Program Coordinator for the REACH program, which stands for Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health. Um, and that's through the Association of Immunization Managers or AIM. And so today I'm really excited to just talk a little bit about my experience with my mental health struggles and how the pandemic has affected me in ways that I know it has affected so many others as well. Uh, so I wanted to talk today about the, how the pandemic has affected my mental health from the perspective of a public health professional, but also as someone who has struggled with mental illness for several years and also just as a person living through the pandemic because it has affected us all. For <clears throat> So first I wanted to acknowledge that the pandemic has taken a toll on almost all, everyone's mental health for a variety of reasons. You don't have to be a public health professional to have been exposed to or directly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And all you have to do is turn on the news to hear about the devastation the pandemic has caused. Um, we all know someone who has had the virus or maybe we have had it ourselves. And we likely know personally or know of someone who has died from the virus, which is devastating. Um, so on top of dealing with and constantly hearing about this illness and death, um, the isolation and loneliness that has resulted from lockdowns and social distancing measures um, can be extremely challenging and detrimental for your mental health. Uh, not being able to see friends and family and maybe not having access to these vital support systems that you need can be really, really hard. Um, and in addition to all of that, our routines and really the entire structure of our daily lives has been disrupted. And this kind of disruption that we have never experienced before can have a really significant negative impact on mental health as well. Um, so we know that the pandemic has affected a ton of individuals' mental health, regardless of whether you're a public health professional or not, but as someone who does work in public health and whose work revolves around COVID-19 disease and vaccines, public health professionals are immersed in thinking about and talking about COVID-19 disease and the vaccines every day for at least eight hours a day, uh, and then maybe they have to go home and think about it as well. So this can be extremely difficult because it's a constant reminder of the damage and the devastation that the pandemic has caused. And it can also be really discouraging to think of all the work that still needs to be done to make sure our communities are healthy and safe. Um, and this can cause a ton of exhaustion and burnout. Uh, we actually in our REACH program had a few webinars earlier this year to address exhaustion and burnout because so many of our um, recipients were expressing these feelings. Um, and it can be difficult to do your job uh, when you're experiencing these feelings of exhaustion and burnout. It can be hard to even want to do your job or to have that motivation and energy that is required to do your job. And, you know, as a public health professional, this job requires you to be present. It requires you to be focused and motivated. And it's really difficult to do that when maybe you're burnt out from hearing about it or experiencing it every day. Um, it's also hard to escape the pandemic as a public health professional because your work revolves around it and then you log off and you still have to deal with it or are reminded of it in your everyday life, whether that's because you're experiencing negative feelings as a result of it or you're dealing with actual illness, deep death or grief because of the pandemic. Um, uh, for me, working specifically with REACH program reci recipients, who what they uh, what these REACH program recipients do is they go out in their uh, communities, these racial and ethnic minority communities, and they try to increase COVID-19 and flu vaccination rates, um, and just in general promote positive public health outcomes. So they're fully immersed in the work, you know, we're fully immersed, immersed in supporting them in that work. 
Um, and so working with these REACH program recipients who work with communities of color and also just being a Black woman, it's difficult to know that your community has been so harmfully impacted by COVID-19 and that the virus still continues to disproportionately impact minority communities. And just knowing that we're all so affected by this, it's, it's difficult to grapple with and, and, you know, acknowledge that concept in your head and, and reconcile it. Um, so the pandemic has also exacerbated mental health struggles and illnesses that many people may have been dealing with previously. So just to personally share my story, uh, I was diagnosed with OCD and anxiety disorder when I was 15. I'm 25 now. And uh, while therapy and medication have significantly helped over the past 10 years, there have been several periods throughout those years that I've really struggled, you know, sometimes for days, sometimes weeks, months, even years. Um, and a lot of those have been during the past years, uh, during, the, during the past two years during the pandemic. Um, the devastation, the pain, death, grief, isolation, loneliness, and sadness that have resulted from the pandemic are extremely overwhelming concepts and things to deal with. And I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of days when I struggle to get out of bed, a lot of days when a lot of tears are involved, when I find it extremely difficult to focus, to be productive, to just get ba basic life tasks done and to function like I used to um, before the pandemic. And I know a lot of people are struggling with that as well. Um, so basically today, I just wanted to recognize that there are a lot of people struggling out there, uh, including me, including public health professionals, including minority communities, and that the pandemic has really made things worse for everyone. Um, but I also wanted to let everyone know that you are not alone in this struggle and in this fight. There are other people out there going through the same things as you, um, and, and you're never alone in your struggles. I also wanted to acknowledge that there is help out there and that there are resources that can allow, allow you to get through these tough times and find ways to cope with the feelings that you're experiencing and the struggles you're facing. Um, <clears throat> personally, I'm taking it one day at a time. My therapist always says that mental health recovery is not linear, it is fluid and it fluctuates. Um, so I'm just trying to do the best I can and that's all we can ask for and that's all anyone can ask for. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to present today, Kristen. Thank you so much, Trevor, and thank you so much for trusting us to be vulnerable enough to talk about your story. Um, I know that personally, my husband and I have seen so much death from COVID-19 that I had to get a cognitive behavioral therapist as well. Um, and I really truly believe that if we're talking about reparations, all Black people need free therapy, if that's the least they could do for us. Um, but it is really paramount, I think, for us to focus on the spectrum of what we deal with and try to turn it off as much as possible. I know that when I log off for the day, I tell my extended family members, I want to talk about it. If you need a link, I'll send you a link to where the data are, research studies, whatever, but I don't want to talk about it. So I appreciate you so much for sharing your story. Um, and now transitioning over to another um, service leader, a leader in service, Pastor Bowens, who I know a lot of the pastors that I work with, my personal pastor, um, you guys have really been hit hard by always having to preside over funerals or, or just really shepherding your congregation through this pandemic. So please, please share with us and, and talk about your story as a pastor and also how you have managed mental health in your congregants during this pandemic. Well, certainly thank you for allowing us to uh, um, to share this information with you. And we're, we're glad to be here. Um, I'm I'm not here by myself, of course. You know, Reverend Darren Innocent, our administrative assistant, my personal administrator is here, along with um, Vivian Armstead, who just does everything at Trinity. Um, they, you know, they hold my hand up. I want to say something very, very briefly, then we won't take your time, at, uh, a lot of your time at all on explaining what we did because of the pandemic. Dr. Harris and, and the um, lovely young lady said something just a second ago, and I'm looking for her name again, and I can't just finish speaking. Both, uh, and, and you're right, um, um, that says a lot about her to be very vulnerable. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But Dr. Harris, you, you talked about the, uh, the, the therapy you part of it, and she said that she's having therapy. And, and I think you probably, both of you are probably at a different age than I am. And believe me, it is hard to get Black folks to talk about their pain. Um, and, and that is needed very, very much. Um, that's something that was never in our vocabulary or in, in our um, medicine cabinet, so to speak. We could go to a therapist, that we could talk to somebody. Um, my age group was always taught to keep that thing to yourself. You never let it get out the home. You never talk about it. And so it's hard for me to deal with what I'm dealing with. And I tell black folks that, hey, listen, you need to go to a therapist. And I think you're right. The young lady said that they don't give us any money for anything else. I, I, I truly agree with you. 
of black folks don't have the money to go to a therapist, at least the ones that I'm dealing with. And so, so it's, it's double trouble for us to deal with what we're trying to deal with this pandemic and so many other other issues that we, we have to deal with as, as, as a black race. Um, and as an African-American pastor, it is extremely hard. And so now we are finally doing what you guys are saying and shifting into that arena, saying to them, you know, how about look at a therapist? I'm not qualified for all of that. I wanted to say that because you both are on something so magnificent and and I wish nothing but the best for you in that area and pray for us that we will help our people get there. Um, but you're right. The pandemic played a major role um, in Trinity Baptist Church and not just Trinity, all churches, as you just said, and certainly uh, in the Columbia, greater Columbia area, we dealt with so much death. And, you know, if I don't have to preach another funeral, I would be more than happy not to do so. Um, I think I'm burnt out because of those, those funerals and the pain that I have to live with. I've seen so many wonderful people that I love and, and go home, I transition, and but I have to be that strong pastor um, um, to be strong for them. And certainly, as you said about vulnerability, that's something that I can't always show. Um, but just being very transparent with you today, it's, it is not easy at all. Uh-oh, I, th I think we might have lost Pastor Bowens. Pastor Bowens, are you there? Oh, no, he was doing so good. Reverend Henderson, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. I'm tr reaching out to him. Okay. Um, you know what? We will go back to him when he's able to, to rejoin us. Um, cause I want him to, there he is. Hi, Pastor Bowens. Okay. I'm back now. I hope, I don't know how much of this you lost of me. You About maybe 30 to 45 seconds. Wow. Right. Yeah. Said a lot there. I don't know what part you heard last. Can anybody tell me? Uh, yeah. You were talking about if you don't have to do another funeral again, you'd rather not. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and, and I was saying, um, next that I don't know how many, um, um I don't know why God spared me. My family and I were, were, were certainly, Affected and impacted by the COVID, and 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 we 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 over, um, overcame it. We are overcomers, and we got through. But there are many people that did not, many pastors that did not, and, and that's very very puzzling and very very um, hard for me because I don't know why God spared me and did not spare them. Those are things that I have to deal with, and that's the reality of my own reality of life. And and folks folks think that we are such strong strong people. Um, but because we try to be strong, we keep so much inside and it tears us apart. You know, it tears me apart. I can't speak because this is real to me. I love people. I love what I'm doing and I love it all. Um, um, but, but, but man, it definitely messes with you. All right. So very quickly, I'll say this. We, we start, we, we, we got a call from one of our senior citizens was not um, coming out anymore. And we discovered a lot of our senior citizens were in the same shape. They were beginning to lose a lot of their cognitive skills. And so I knew I had to do something immediately. And so I got with Governor Henderson, got with um, um, Vivian Armstead, um, said, and told, told them, look, we need to start a program. We started this program called So Social and Emotional Wellness, which really just means uh, it was mental health sessions. We had to start this program because I felt that it was, it was of great necessity to get my singers out of that house, get them out of their houses as quick as I could. And I know that we often say that their families are mostly responsible for them, but that I'd be a responsible ability also because they're my parishioners. And I wanted to do something very, very quickly. Let's get them out. Let's put a program together. And so we put this pilot program together very, very quickly um, with these great guys that, that, that assist me. And we got them out on Tuesday. Every Tuesday, we started our first class session in March. And we go from 11 o'clock to uh, 1 o'clock. And this is what we're doing with them. We provide transportation if transportation is needed. Um, um, and and um, I'm in there facilitating just to make sure that the pastor's there because they love to come when they see the pastor. So we started this program to have just what you just talked about earlier, um, co-values. We wanted, wanted them to be very honest, trustworthiness. Um, we want to talk about family. We want to remind them we are family. Yes, our faith plays a major role. And then also friends, have friends to talk to. I'm trying to encourage them to talk to people, even if you know, they're not in therapy, they can talk to somebody. 
um, but but they need to talk with somebody who they can trust. And so those are our core values in that particular um, session. That we're going to be honest. We're going to be we're going to we're going to be trustworthy. If we stay right in the room. It will not go out. Um, and then families and and your faith will play a major role in certainly having other friends. Again, these are our major topics. Um, we we are talking on stress, and some of these uh, topics overlap: stress, anxiety, loneliness, fear, complacency. Meaning just to get out of the get out of the comfort zone and and that, doing that same old same old. That's what we're doing with them now: depression, anger, and death. And and we're bringing experts in to certainly help me and to talk with them for about one hour, and then we'll do other things after the second after we eat and for lunch because they have to have medication that they are taking, so we want to make sure they eat. So we have one hour of that particular uh, session, whatever we're on right now, we just finished anxiety, we we'll have two more um, uh, weeks of anxiety, then we were going to loneliness, and boy, they're ready to go into loneliness. Uh, and so that, so that helps men a lot because they really want to participate. Our extracurriculum activities that, that we're doing, and again, remember this is a pilot program. We, we, we don't have it down, but we're truly a work in progress. We are mainly focusing on fellowship and just to get them out to see each other and see other people. Um, we have a, in attendance now, maybe about anywhere from 40 to 50 senior citizens coming out every Tuesday. And we're trying to get it out more and more to the greater Columbia to other other uh, churches and other, not just churches, but but, but senior citizens everywhere. Um, we use games that sharpen cognitive skills that you already spoke about, the cognitive part of us, what we're dealing with. And this is real good. Believe it or not, guys, this, and, and I saw a movie, I think many of you remember the movie with, I cannot think of his name right now, he's, he, he committed suicide, Robin Robin Williams. And he had a very good movie of, um, dealing with music. And um, and that was a form of therapy, and they love it. They love the songs that they want to hear, even if they may be gospel songs, they may be Frank Sinatra, or whatever it may be. Um, they want to hear something old. We find a way to get that song for them. It's like therapy to them. So music therapy is something that we're doing. Um, all kind of games to chopping their cognitive skills. And then we we do seven minutes um, at the at the minimal and ten at the max of physical fitness chair exercises. Um, they love it. They don't have to get out the chair. Don't have to do a whole bunch of running. Just get all in the chair. And then we're also doing nutrition, nutrition, health eating, healthy eating. We are, and now that's a little hard for us, believe it or not, because of their age. Um, of course, I'm a senior citizen now, believe it or not, I'll be 59 um, this month. So so it's not too hard for me, but it's, it, it is extremely hard for them because they want the fried chicken. They want, and then I'm not trying to throw a, a shade or insult or anything. That's what they're used to. And it's hard for them to, we talk, we talk, I had a whole seminar on Tuesday on olive, olive what is it, Reverend Olive, um, olive oil. Olive, olive oil. Olive oil. And and the benefits and the different types of virgin uh, olive oil, olive oil, and and boy, you know they were okay, but they were like, you know, wait a minute, you know, I'm used to this, and how is that going to change the taste? So some things are not uh, easy, but, but they are listening. So those are our extracurricular activities. Um, this entire program is set up um, for uh, um, again for our seniors. We're about to start one at night for our adult class, getting them out for one hour so they can talk about what's going on with husband with wife. And once a month, we're going to do one with children. We're going to bring in experts that deal with the children to help them out. In my one of my classes, in my when I did my Masters of Divinity work in seminary, um, one of my professors um, enlightened me to something that I never thought I would ever have to face. And that is, he said, Thurman, you talk a lot about your children, and I love my children. And they're all grown. Now, my kids are 30 and, uh, the what are they, 30 and 32, a uh, boy and a girl. Um, and, and dad was pretty tough because I wanted to be a, the dad that I felt that I needed. But nevertheless, um, he said, what do your children do when they are stressed? You know, he said, when you are stressed and you are filled with anxiety, what, 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 what do your children do? He said, you can, you're a grown man. You can you can deal with it. And I never thought about that. I said, well, you know, I don't know what people get mad to go in their room. I guess I don't know what they're supposed to do. And um, he said, you got to give them an outlet. I never thought about that. Just as I never thought guys who you guys are younger now than I am and you got your own children. My wife had to teach me. She said, honey, you're not going to get to get through the lawn, let you get through the Whitfield. You're gonna learn how to discipline them totally different. I didn't understand that. I didn't. I didn't understand what you were saying. You got to do, you're gonna to have to give it to, um, to to talk to her or whatever. You can't just do beating or you can't do. And I said beating. I'm not talking about you know over the top stuff. You can't do spanking and all that. You want to find a better way. And over the years, my wife helped me find a better way. 
Now I understand how to talk to my daughter versus dealing with my son. And my son would just, you know, I could slap at him, be mad, and in 10 minutes, he and I are talking again. I slap at my daughter. It'll be about 10 months before she talked to me again. That's just the difference in, in the two of them. And so I'm trying to tell now my parishioners, I need to help help you um, help them because someone helped me. And that is how do we how do we get to our children without them cutting you off? And and how do we have a session for them to be able to explain how they are feeling with this pandemic school and the stress and all that's going on with them because they are being stressed. So we're going to have a class, a start a class on that in the next month, along with our adult class, but we want to have the right to bring in experts to help me out. I'm just a facilitator of all of those classes because they'll come and to see the pastor, believe it or not. Um, but it, it, so far, it's been very beneficial to, it's been very beneficial for me and the parishioners who have played a part in it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to talk with them and be very transparent. They've never met a pastor like me that tell how I'm feeling. I don't mind crying. Um, Reverend Henderson and Vivian will tell you that. Um, but I'm very, very transparent about my feelings. I've always been. And I think it'll help me out. But if they see that I'm real, it'll help them out. Um, so we're loving it. We want to get it to as many people as we can. We believe that other communities and other states and certainly other churches need this and need this very quickly. We don't want to see an elderly person just die in the house and just, just, just draw up and fade away because nobody got them out and rescued them in time. That's what we're doing at Trinity. I'm very, very uh, happy about it. And very, very, very delighted and thankful that you guys allowed us to share what we're doing at the Trinity Baptist Church. Absolutely, Pastor Bowens. I completely uh, understand the trying to get our elders to move into a different way of eating, but I always tell them you don't have to change ex all, everything that you're eating because a part of our culture is a part of what gives us good mental health. We really you know, cultivate our food experience around our social support and our families and friends. And so if we learn ways to simply alter what we have, we can still be healthy and eat nutrient dense food. So thank you so much for giving us that holistic approach, just like Dr. Harris and Trevor um, were saying about what you're doing at uh, Trinity Baptist Church. So now we will move over into our microsite feedback. I will stop sharing our PowerPoint and move over to sharing the actual microsite so I can walk you through our first draft and what we have so far. Um, so uh, all of our microsites that we do every single month, we started in March with kidney disease, chronic kidney disease and vaccines. April was Black Maternal Health and Vaccines, and obviously this month is about mental health. Um, they all kind of have the same look and feel, but obviously the information is very, very different. Um, there will be, obviously we have defining mental health. We wanna make sure we level set for everyone who visits this website and all of the materials that we create flyers, infographics also will have sound bites of this information. We go a little deeper into allostatic load and mental health inequities. We talk about mental health inequities across all of the communities of color and historically excluded communities. We go into the pandemic's toll on mental health a lot more in depth, in depth here on the website. Um, and then mental health of uh, Black Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have a ton of resources for you. So what we wanted to be able to do was provide solutions and resources and not just really talk about the problem only, but give you options um, where you can go to seek online mental health services, like Dr. Harris was saying. I found my cognitive behavioral therapist on therapyforblackgirls.com. There's Black Men Heal. There are websites for the LGBTQI community, the Asian American Pacific Islander, Hispanic Latinx, Indigenous people as as well. Um, so really quickly, this is what it's going to look like. Again, I'm not going to sit here and let you read it in detail because you will get a copy of this. Everyone who signed up for the webinar, even if they're not here today, we have your email addresses so you will get all of this information. Um, we try to do our best to make sure that all of the images you see are culturally um, representative and responsive so that we're not just contributing to the noise of not having black and brown faces seen in our, um, in our content, in our education dissemination. Again, all of this is a very, very deep dive. So as you can see, the AAPI aspect and, and perspective, Hispanic and Latinx, um, indigenous communities, 
LGBTQI. We also go into mental health and individuals living with disabilities. So there's a lot of intersectionalities that we live with as humans. And all of that plays a role in our mental health and whether we are able to use appropriate coping strategies for poor mental health, improving that, or in dealing with our mental illness. Um, working during the pandemic, we dive a little bit deeper into all of the categories that we, talk, we talked about and spoke about during the um, presentation. Um, pandemics toll across generations. So there's a little bit of a difference in between how the elderly and the young and young adults and everything in between have um, bore the brunt of their mental health during this pandemic. And so we talk a little about that. We talk a little about uh, the differences in males and females and how we have all um, endured the pandemic differently and access to mental health services. So what actually happened? Who was accessing mental health services during the pandemic? And actually a lot of people in general uh, really started to uh, go to even their primary care physicians and screen more for their mental health. And so then we talk about disparities in outcomes and existing while black and all of the solutions. So here are the resources as well. Um, and we will be posting the recording of today's webinar on the website. We will also hopefully have the perspective videos from Pastor Bowens and Trevor Jennings by next week. So that will also be posted here. And we have our sources for you to go and do more readings and learnings um, for yourself. So now let's get into the portion where you get to tell us everything you think in the chat. I love this part of the webinar. I'm going to ask Chinny if you could actually share your Jamboard. Um, and that will help me focus a lot on the chat box so that I can make sure we're capturing all of the feedback. I think you're able to share, Chinny. Okay, give me a minute, please. Okay. Um, and so the Jamboard will also be here. Know. It's really just a virtual platform and a way for us to gather notes and feedback in, in a more graphical way so that it's not just death by piece of paper. <laughs> All right, so we'll queue up the very first poll question. I think there's a question in the Q&A too. Thank you, please continue to put your Q&A questions. Um, I hope to be able to get to at least three or four of them. Keiko, are you ready with the first Q&A poll? Or maybe it's not cute. No. If you could please mute yourself if you're not speaking, that would be great. Okay. So um, with whom would you share a microsite that details the effects of the pandemic on the mental health of communities of color? Um, that could be your friends, family, coworkers, peers, colleagues, your church, um, any your kids, anybody you think might benefit from the actual microsite. So if you put your answer in the chat, that would be Fantastic. Elected officials and administrators. That's a really good one. I don't think we've thought about before. I'll take that back to the team. Church community, faith, family members, and panelists, you're more than welcome to uh, contribute to our conversation as well. The community of faith. Christian, can you keep reading it out, please? <laughs> yes. I can see that. Thank you. Yes, I can. Any more? Um, wanted to ensure that you had my email address. Yes, thank you so much, Allison Brown. Employers, educators, and academic admins. 
I'll yes, and we do have your email address. Chapter members, social network, CBO, so community-based organizations. All right, that's some good stuff. I don't think we've thought about that in the other webinars. All right, so moving on to the next question, Chinny. Okay. <laughs> Is there vital information missing from the microsite that should be included? Also, we have um, we will have access to the chat after the webinar. So um, please feel free to continue to add, even if you're adding to a previous question, we can add the notes in afterwards. Dr. Holmes has said, as a physician, um, oh, employees of youth organizations get vaccinated even if you have had COVID to avoid reinfection. So making sure that that's present on the website so that people know probably do um, add a couple more bullets to our risk mitigation section. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Anything else that might be missing that you think we need to incorporate here? I think that means we did a good job of researching, Jenny. <laughs> Links to providers that look like communities of color. Okay, cool. I think a lot of the um, resources have those links embedded within the resources, but I think having pulling those out would be good as well. All right, next question. What challenges from the pandemic do people face when caring for their mental health? The panelists mentioned a lot of challenges. Is there anything that you think we've missed during today's webinar or if, if um, we need to add it to the microsite that there are 90,000 deaths this year? Yeah, I think the um, people think that mortality has completely gone down <laughs> and it has not. And that may be um, the onus of, you know, us as public health professionals to continue to push the data out and let people know what incidence and mortality looks like. Anything else? All right, let's go ahead. Oh, wait, the wait for appointments with therapists. Absolutely, that's a lot, it's, it's months and months sometimes. Um, lack of understanding of what they're feeling. You can be depressed and not know. Yeah, a lot of people think they're just tired, that they're just exhausted. Um, grieving, in most states, African-American males lead in the group non-vaccinated. PTSD, absolutely an issue. Loss of insurance due to loss of employment, if you probably had COVID, especially in states that did not expand ACA. Yeah. And that's a burden for a lot of people because some mental health services are like $300 an hour. Awesome, awesome. All righty, let's go ahead and move on to the next question, Chinny. Um, in light of the decrease in mask mandates across the US, what are some other risk mitigation strategies that we can employ to assist in reducing severe risks of complications from COVID, complications that may exacerbate poor mental health and mental um, health illnesses. I think we um, have one already to get vaccinated, even if you've been infected to reduce the risk of reinfection. Um, yes, it is a constant reminder of systemic racism, absolutely. 
need to educate our non-insured about the federal, federally, qual federally qualified health centers, so FQHCs for Medicare and mental health care. All right, Chenny, let's move on to our last question since we have five minutes. This was such a good webinar, we're running out of time. Um, okay, what are your recommendations for ensuring this is microsite is culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate? And being comfortable with being the only person wearing a mask, that was for the last question. Um, I'm always comfortable, ain't nobody can tell me to pull my mask off, so. <laughs> Access the free and charitable clinics. A lot of people don't know um, that they exist, actually. Um, question again, please. So how can we ensure as a team here at NMQF and SHC that our microsite is culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate? Making sure health literacy is, is uh, correct making sure that we're uh, representative of our communities. Keep washing hands, absolutely. Getting as many eyes on it as possible, amen. We got a list, so <laughs> all the panelists look out for an email so you can uh, kind of review it. Posting information to social media, yes, we will definitely be doing that. We'll be creating social media graphics and flyers so that we can um, uh, disseminate widely. All right. I think that's it. Chenny, I hate to rush you because I know you're uh, copying and pasting. Explaining to members why their info must be culturally competent. Amen. Amen. We got about three more minutes and I want to be respectful, especially of our panelists time. Keep giving us a chat. Again, we'll have access to it. Um, but now I want to get to the Q&A box. So research has shown that the term Latinx is not an acceptable term for most Hispanics. Thank you so much for um, giving us that tidbit. I know that we actually have done a lot of research just talking qualitatively in focus groups, but also in the literature. Um, and there seems to be a bit of back and forth in the literature, but across groups where we get direct feedback from folks, they just say the exact same thing you tell us. So um, we really wanna be respectful of that and we will be mindful of that going forward for sure. There were some pre-submitted questions that I wanted to get to at least the first couple of questions. Um, so number one, how is the pandemic's toll on mental health being measured? Dr. Harris, do you have any info on that one? Yeah, there's several different ways. Um, one of the things that that you keep track of in the, the EHRs is when people come, there's screenings like the PHQ-9, the GAD-7. These are screenings for depression and anxiety. And so you can query these databases. I saw one study, I think it was June 2020, that the performance of these tests was up like 457% and like 407%. You know, and this was in the middle of the pandemic. So that's one way you can look at prescriptions that are going out. You can look at uh, the reasons for ER visits. Uh, we saw a dramatic increase for children and teenagers in, in mental health uh, visits to the, the emergency rooms and urgent cares. So there's lots of different ways that you, you can track it and different studies will use different ways. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And then the last one really quickly before we close, how are telehealth medical mobile units being used to reach the poor and vulnerable populations across the country? I, I know that um, a lot of telehealth services have um, ramped up as far as the use of Zoom and platforms like it. Um, and over the phone telehealth, but I'm not sure that mobile units have uh, gone back into um, going back into rural areas just because of the pandemic. Dr. Harris, do you know of any that are continuing to, to thrive or, or Trevor? 
I do know of some uh, REACH program recipients that have deployed mobile units to, um, I don't know about rural areas, but definitely uh, racial and ethnic minority communities, um, you know, areas that have a heavy uh, minority population. Um, I do know that, that they've been using some mobile units. I haven't heard about it in a few months, but I do know that last year that was a big thing. Okay, awesome. All right, we are at time. I know that was a mad dash to the finish. Um, thank you guys so much, Dr. Harris. Pastor Bowens, Reverend Henderson, Trevor Jennings, thank you, Chenny, thank you guys so much for all of your help. Miss Vivian, I appreciate you so much and thank you audience for joining us today. Have a good weekend. Bye.